A very good morning to all of you and welcome back to the channel. So we are starting with today's analysis session for 4th of July, 2023. So here we have the topic related to the SEO summit. So Prime Minister to host Xi Jinping put in Sharif virtually for the SEO summit. So the basic things like the members, the member countries, their location that becomes important and when did India join it? Were the latest members to join it? Uh, and like there are topics like what the main areas on which SEO focuses upon the initiatives by SEO. So that's important. So there's going to be a virtual summit and Central Asian economies are very important. We are like India also, it's trying to, you know, increase its collaboration bilaterally with the Central Asian economies. So even the Central Asian summit that was held, that is very important. Then the New Delhi uh, declaration and two joint statements on countering radicalism and on digital transformation. So sources, they say that four outcomes, they will be adopted at this summit. And then there was an agreement or an economic cooperation uh, initiatives that is being negotiated. Though it is unclear whether all the countries, especially India, will sign it or not. So that's there. So you need to be clear with the India stand on different initiatives taken up by SEO. So Indian refiners said to start paying in yuan for the Russian oil. So Indian refiners, they have begun paying for some oil imports from Russia in Chinese yuan, according to the sources. So that's the update and Western uh, punishments over the Russia's invasion of Ukraine. They have shifted global trade flows for its top export, that is the crude oil, with the India emerging as the largest buyer of seaborne Russian oil, even as it casts about uh, for how to pay for it amid the shifting sanctions. So we're seeing that there is like not major impact on Russian economy in terms of the sanctions that have been imposed by the Western world. But uh, even when we're talking about this crude oil trade between India and Russia, so there are some concerns about the currency that you'll be using to pay because earlier there was much focus upon internationalization of rupee so we were basically using rupee for this crude oil trade but now obviously russia is also having some concerns that how it would be using that uh, indian currency forward so how is it going to be useful for russia so there are some concerns and basically we are not on the same page as far as this thing is concerned. So despite that concern, we are seeing that India is amongst the top players when it comes to buying the Russian crude oil. So pending for two years, Supreme Court to take a please against the dilution of Article 370 on 11th July. So basically, through deprivation or abolition of this article, it deprived the Jammu and Kashmir of its special privileges and it led to the bifurcation of the state in 2019 into two union territories. So there are some um, pending issues. So the petitions, they have challenged a presidential order on 5th of August 2019, which took away the special status under Article 370. So these petitions are challenging that very decision. So center agrees to deploy additional armed forces for Bengal Panchayat polls. So this we have already taken up with a repeat. So Supreme Court tells the Delhi government that you will have to share the details of money spent on advertisements. So Apex Court sought the details of the funds which are spent on publicity over the past three years after Delhi government said that it does not have funds to spare for the RRTS project, have not received the GST compensation. So RRTS project is the Rapid Railway Transit System project. 
So uh, should we say all the funds for the advertisements to be diverted to this common project or not? This is what the bench of the justices had to say. And the bench's remark came when the Delhi government expressed its inability to spare the funds, saying the center had not given its GST compensation. So basically, they are shifting this burden on the central government, saying that they haven't received the GST compensation, but they have the funds or they are spending, they're ready to spend on the advertisements, but they're not having funds to spare for this rapid railway transit system project. So basically, this project is meant to provide high-speed and world-class public connectivity, decongest the cities, reduce air pollution in Delhi and its neighboring states. So Tamil Nadu flags shortage in its share of the Kaveri water. So interstate river water dispute, sharing of the river waters uh, has been uh, disputed amongst different states over different rivers. So that is the very first thing you need to know about the river and the states were party to the dispute. So you're talking about Tamil Nadu and it is having concerns over its share and says that it's basically very less when we talk about the distribution of the Kaveri River water. So objecting to the deficit in its share of water received from Karnataka, uh, the Tamil Nadu government on one day wrote to the Kaveri Water Management Authority. So you need to know about how such uh, interstate water disputes, they are resolved and what is the role of center. Then um, when you talk about the past incidents, what is important Supreme Court judgments, if any, over such issues. And then you need to also know about uh, the location of important dams located on these rivers. Coming to the editorial page. So this article is saying, or this is the stand of the article regarding this thing about giving India this NATO plus status. So it says that India should refuse this America's NATO plus bait. So it was during the virtual press briefing in March 2023 on the NATO's focus on South Asia and Indo-Pacific region that United States permanent representative to NATO was quoted as saying that NATO alliance is open to more engagement and should India seek that. So reflecting the same sentiment, the U.S. House Select Committee on Strategic Competition between the U.S. and the Chinese Communist Party, they recommended strengthening the NATO plus framework that uh, said that they'll be including India in the grouping. So NATO template does not apply to India yet on the eve of the Prime Minister Modi's visit to the US. The Senate India Caucus co-chair, even he shared his plans to table a bill to bring India into the NATO plus fold. So what are going to be the implications for India? That is very important area for us to understand. So firstly, what is the difference between NATO and NATO plus and which all countries are not a part of NATO? That can be also one of the important areas. So NATO, it is a transatlantic military alliance of 31 countries with majority of members from Europe. So after the dissolution of Soviet Union and the end of Cold War, we saw many thought that NATO would lose its relevance. So on the contrary, NATO, it has only, it is not only survived, but it has expanded with time also. And the latest country to join is Finland. And even now, Sweden is also waiting to join NATO. So it, it appears to be getting the much needed ground for survival thanks to Russia's triad against and the against it and the invasion of Ukraine. So with NATO swelling its expanse, some analysts they even see the onset of Cold War 2.0. So that is the thing. So talking about NATO plus, so it refers to the security arrangement of the NATO and the five treaty alliances of the US. So here the 
countries that are Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Israel, and South Korea, they are the members. And that is to enhance the global defense cooperation and win the strategic competition with the Chinese Communist Party. So that is the main purpose of NATO+. Plus. So NATO+, Plus basically includes the member countries of NATO and the five treaty allies of the US. So these are the three, oh, sorry, these are the five countries which are a part of it. So NATO plus it is right now not officially recognized uh, or an established concept, but uh, like the inclusion of these countries as members, it would require a complex process of negotiation and assessment of their compatibility. So focus of NATO plus is clearly on containing China, whereas when we talk about the focus area of NATO, so it was the Soviet Union and now it is Russia. So the main reason behind this Ukraine war is expanding NATO more closer towards the Russian borders. So that's the whole issue why this war started and why Russia is basically it attacked Ukraine. So therefore, considering its dispute with China, India remains a missing link in this NATO plus framework. So for India, obviously, we'll have to understand how things can go if India joins NATO plus because we also share a land border with China. So since NATO plus is, it's clearly mentioned that it is aimed at containing China. So obviously we'll need to understand this aspect as well. So in light of increasing regional security challenges, India joining NATO plus framework, it could provide it with a security umbrella with protection and deterrence. But India could also gain access to advanced military technologies, intelligence sharing platforms, interoperability with other member states. So these are some of the potential benefits that India can gain. So it can strengthen India's defense capabilities and the modernization efforts. But, uh, but basically, this bit needs to be assessed in the larger context of India's strategic autonomy also. So firstly, that getting into a NATO framework, it will annoy Russia and China both. And obviously, Russia is also a very, like we call Russia, India's an all-weather friend. And as I said, that as we share land border with China, so even that needs to be taken into account. So apart from the robust strategic partnership, Russia, it has been useful to India in dealing with the regional security challenges and importantly, moderating the stance of China also. So even in, in a dealing with China, Russia plays an important role for India. So these are some important things which we need to focus upon. So should it join in one stroke or India's solidified strategic partnership with Russia, it will crumble down. So balancing these relationships and managing the potential geopolitical consequences would be a significant challenge for India. Secondly, while aligning with the US-led alliance system, it may be tempting due to the threats which are posed by China, but it could ultimately prove counterproductive and detrimental for India as well. So having a military framework, it will limit India's freedom of action and it will prevent it from pursuing an independent policy towards China. So once we join this US-led alliance, so obviously our independence, our autonomy would be at stake in terms of the policies that we have or the way we want to deal with China. So we are having our own bilateral issues with China and a strategy for the Indo-Pacific region also. So hoping into the Taiwan strategy of the US under the NATO plus, it will complicate India's security further with possibilities of Chinese justification for further military buildup along the India-China border and frequent intrusions, which are obviously possible in future. And third area is that India has traditionally maintained a policy of strategic autonomy, allowing it to engage with the various nations and blocs based on its own interests. So we are having our own concerns, our own interests. So accordingly, our traditional relationships are shaped accordingly on uh, such principles. So joining NATO framework, it would require India to align its defense and security policies with objectives and the strategies of the alliance. 
so thereby potentially undermining India's autonomy. And the non-line policy even therefore be at stake, so it could strain the relationships with the countries, especially the neighbors and the regional organizations that value India's independence and it could also limit its flexibility in engaging with the other regional powers. So these are all the important areas which needs to be taken into account when we are talking about whether India should join NATO plus or not. So India's priorities, they need to be clear. So the, uh, the priorities, they line addressing its own regional dynamics, which includes a unique set of security challenges that India faces, like the border disputes, the terrorism and regional conflicts. So NATO, it has certain competencies to deal with such issues. Its larger geopolitical agenda, starting from Eurasia to Indo-Pacific, it may divert the resources and attention away from these pressing issues and therefore will not be much help to India. So for the time being, India's posturing through the Quad looks more promising than the NATO plus bait. And though China it remains an elephant in the room during its summits. So stock take before the global stock take. So here the bond climate climate change conference was the last big milestone in the climate negotiations before the first global stock take under the Paris Agreement at COP28 that would be there in Dubai in December. So the global stock take is mandated under Article 14 of the Paris Agreement to assess collective progress towards the long-term goals. So this includes the progress on greenhouse gas reductions, building resilience to climate impacts, securing finance to address climate crisis. So the details of the Paris Agreement I mentioned here, which we obviously know. So we are focusing upon the just transition pathways. Like when we're talking about the green energy transition, so at the same time, it's important for us to ensure the energy security also. So India's climate policy is derived from the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. So our long-term low emission development strategy at COP27, India underlined the need for financing a just transition in sectors like energy and transport in order to reach a net zero emissions by 2070. So that is a target level. So just transition means that transformational pathways, they need to be carried out in a way that is as fair and inclusive as possible to everyone concerned. So we are concerned about the difficulties it is going to face in decoupling its economic development from the greenhouse gas emissions. So as stated that the route to just transition needs to be clubbed with the means of implementation. So all these are the keywords. Please keep them in your mind. Then climate finance always, this is a part of any article or any discussion that we talk about the climate change, dealing with it. So that's there. So 76% rupees 2000 notes have been returned back to the banks and they have mostly been returned through the deposits. So this comes after the RBS May 19 announcement for withdrawal of rupees 2000 notes from the circulation. So there is rise of India's total coal production in first quarter is at 8%. So you just need to, you know, have a look at whether India's dependence on coal right now it is increasing or not. The thermal power stations that we have, are they increasing or are they reducing or are that stable number? So all of that is important. You need to have clarity about this thing. So legality of the Delhi ordinance. Again, this is a repeat, but yes, we'll take this up again because 
we are seeing this topic after a gap of few days. So ordinance that was promulgated by the president. 19th May amended the GNC to D Act and it took away the services from the jurisdiction of the Delhi government. However, Supreme Court has held in large number of cases that since Parliament does not possess the judicial powers, it cannot negate the decision of the court. So whatever is the decision of the court, that needs to be upheld and that cannot be basically surpassed through an ordinance. So this ordinance, which was issued by the president of India, it took away the powers regarding services that existed with the Delhi government. So what is the actually, uh, you know, the validity of this ordinance? So it is like it has nullified the court's decision, which raises serious legal and constitutional questions. So even here also, the same thing is written that even the court has reiterated this thing that the decision by the court or the verdict it cannot be violated through the ordinances so the first question which raises uh, arises is whether an ordinance which is promulgated by the president or a bill that is passed by the parliament can it nullify the court's decision so supreme court has held in large number of cases that since parliament it does not possess judicial powers so it cannot negate the decision of court without changing the basis of the decision. So ordinance does not furnish any ground for nullifying the court's decision. So Supreme Court based its decision to bring the services within the government or within the jurisdiction of the Delhi Assembly and the government on the constitutional mandate which is contained in Article 239AA. So this was the Supreme Court judgment that the power rests with the Delhi Assembly so basically, ordinance was issued to counter this thing. So the law which was declared by the Supreme Court is sought to be negated by this ordinance in the following ways. That the section 3A of this new act, it says that notwithstanding anything contained in any judgment of any court, the Legislative Assembly shall not have the power to make laws with respect to any matter that is enumerated in Entry 41, which means related to the services. So this is what the ordinance talks about. So here, this is one area where it is going counter to the Supreme Court judgment. So this is clearly indicating that the section seeks to nullify the judgment of the Supreme Court. So no authority is empowered to direct anyone that an order of the court shall have no effect and shall not be followed. So since the ordinance does not cite any new ground for nullifying the judgment, it becomes legally unsustainable. And after taking away the services from the Delhi government, this ordinance, it further confers the powers of posting, transfer, and disciplinary matters on an authority which is named as the National Capital Civil Services Authority, which consists of a chairman and two members. So, they have been transferred with this power according to this ordinance. And another thing which this ordinance talks about is that um, if the secretary to the council of minister forms an opinion that the cabinet decision is not in accordance with the law or the rules of the procedure, he can bring it to the notice of the LG for his decision thereon. So basically, everything, basically the power gets concentrated in the hands of the secretary to the council of ministers. So basically, that would depend upon his or her opinion. If they feel that the cabinet decision is violating any law so the person can inform the lg and then the decision would be taken up by the lg so basically the secretary has the power to review the cabinet decision so all that is required is for the secretary to form an opinion and he can then act on such opinion by referring it to the lg who can rescind the cabinet decision so basically all the powers, in a way, they are being concentrated in the hands of central government or the union government through different means. And obviously, LG plays an important role here. So another thing 
is talking about the new procedure for summoning and proroguing a session of the assembly. So under the present constitutional system, the decision to convene a session of the legislature is taken by the cabinet and thereafter it is conveyed to the governor who signs the summons. So this is the practice which is followed in all the countries where the parliamentary system of government exists. But a strange and inscrutable procedure, now it has been introduced by this ordinance, which says that the proposal for convening the assembly, it shall be submitted through the chief secretary to the LG and the chief minister for their opinion before issuing the summons. So as per section 6 of this GNCTD Act, the LG shall for, uh, from time to time be able to summon the assembly. So he will be doing so on the advice of the Council of Ministers. So that is what basically even the constitution talks about. So basically this is not a discretionary power in the hands of LG to decide about summoning the house. So these are different uh, important areas. You can look at the articles of the constitution related to these respective areas. So we understood this concept very nicely, greedflation, a few days back, and it's counter argument. So how consumers ultimately, they decide the prices. So many economists, they have questioned the validity of the argument that Corporate thirst for higher profits is the cause behind inflation. So they see it as mostly a political narrative which is built around the issue of inflation rather than as an economic explanation of high inflation since the pandemic. So that is one side. So few economists, you've seen that they're questioning the explanation. So they say that this is not an economic explanation of high inflation. And this involves political elements. It's a political narrative that you are seeing that it is because of the corporate's thirst for higher profits that we are seeing inflation. But again, we are not saying that it is 100% because of the corporate sector. So women, they are struggling at the relief camps as per a rights group. So women's rights body said that the relief camps in Manipur, they were in a grim condition and they were mostly being run with the efforts of well-meaning citizens and civil society groups with very limited support from the state government. So most of the people in the camps, they are ordinary people. So Prime Minister, he meets with the Council of Ministers and speaks of Vision 2047. So issues like cryptocurrency regulation, public funding of the digital infrastructure, something that became an urgent requirement with when the pandemic induced the lockdowns happened between 2020 and 22, and where India has much to show the world they were also spoken of by the Prime Minister. So Centre announces a scheme to support the minor rape victims. So recognizing the trauma which is faced by the minor rape victims, Union government has decided to provide medical, financial and infrastructure support to the victims in cases where the sexual assault results in pregnancies. So the special scheme which is announced by the Women and Child Development Ministry, it would operate under the ages of this Nirbhaya Fund and an amount of rupees 74 crore has been allocated. So we have additionally leveraged the administrative structure of Mission Vatsala in collaboration with state governments, child care institutions to actualize the support to the minor victims. 
So Mission Vatsale, it was launched in 2021. It focused on the protection and welfare of children. And here we have the data by NCRB. And then talking about the fast track code, so government has already accelerated access to justice for the minor victims of rape by establishing 415 POXO fast track codes in the country. So we are focusing upon the first delivery of justice through them. So the scheme aims to provide integrated support to girl child victims under one roof, facilitate immediate emergency and non-emergency access to a range of services. So China seeks to expand its cooperation with the Russian Navy. And we know that after this war, specifically after this Ukraine war, Russia-China closeness has been increasing. So that's obviously an important thing to focus upon. We can't miss on that. So he also said that the two, they should regularly organize joint exercises, joint cruises, and joint military skills competitions. So they need to expand their practical cooperation in professional fields. So again, manufacturing growth also eased in June. So we saw that a few days back, the corporate, the core sector growth rate, even that has basically subdued massively. So there was a massive fall in the growth rate of the eight core sector and hair racing. Even manufacturing growth eased in June. So S&P Global India Manufacturing Purchasers Manager Index eased to 57.8 from 58.7 in the month of May. And new orders, they grow at a fast clip, compelling the firms to ramp up their output at a pace that is among the fastest in 18 months. So that is positive news. And even businesses, they raise their output charges. So momentum remains moderate. So strong demand uptick in the outputs for the firms to hire more workers. And overall business confidence that rose to a six-month high. And positive demand dynamics that exist and greater labor cost push the charge inflation to a 13-month high. Coming to the Mint newspaper, so why is Paris on the boil? So thousands of people, they've been arrested. So what actually triggered this current process, uh, protest and the uh, crisis? So officers which were involved in this incident, basically, uh, we, there was an incident where an Algerian and Moroccan descent person, he was shot and killed at a traffic stop by the policeman. So the policemen, the officers involved, they were initially claimed that they shot Nahil in self-defense as he tried to claw his car into them. However, there was a video of this incident which revealed that officers shot him as he tried to pull away from them after being stopped for a traffic offense. So this incident, it has triggered widespread protests in France. Basically, the people are on streets to condemn the police brutality. So how has the government reacted? So President Emmanuel Macron condemned the killing of Nahil as inexcusable. Officer responsible was placed under investigation. However, the government has also strenuously denied claims of a culture of police violence against the minorities. So we are seeing such incidents rising even in other countries in the Western world. So it has also strongly condemned the protest with Macron blaming social media for fanning the flames. 
So quote of the day by Amika, Amitabh Kansal. So he is India's G20 Sherpa. So he says that the startup innovators, they start innovating and lose out on the good governance. So today's startup is tomorrow, a Fortune 500 company. And so issue of the financial proprietary and the governance is important. We must build culture of great good governance among the startups. So the startups, they need to focus upon the good governance sector also, apart from definitely the area of innovation, which they focus upon. So factory output growth tips in June, but it still remains robust. So elevated inflationary pressures, they are still a key challenge for the economy. So there's a growing issue about claiming of the organic food. So government plans crack down on the organic food with false claims. So here, the role of the food regulator, the Food Safety Standards Authority of India becomes important. So it has directed all its food testing laboratories to upgrade and optimize their facilities and procedures to handle accurate organic food testing. So India and European Union can redo the international economic order. The question is how? So they have a unique opportunity to deepen their partnership on trade, digitization, and climate change. So these can be the focus areas. And that's how they can basically reshape the global economic order. So there are common concerns and they have a unique opportunity in the 2020s to deepen their partnership and shape the global agenda on trade, digitization, climate change, and security. So European Union, it wants unrestricted cross-border flow of data between the two sides, which also includes allowing the storage of data in the EU countries under the proposed free trade agreement. And India's data protection bill, it has given guidelines on data protection, data storage, and cross-border flow of data. So these are basically the demands of European Union that they want much more freer flow of data on both the sides. But there was like an apprehension and concerns which were raised according to this proposed data protection bill that you need to store the data in India only. So let's see what is going to be the final provision in this draft bill once it gets passed and becomes a law. Coming to Financial Express newspaper. So let's see. So GST Council likely to approve the tribunal rules next week. So only 40% of the corporate income taxpayers, they've registered under GST. So focusing upon the quick dispute resolution. So GST Council likely to approve the rules for the creation of GST tribunals and appointment of its members. So data triangulation being done with the income tax department to check tax evasion and improve the compliance. And then... Also focusing upon the fake registration of the GSTs. So when we talk about boosting the exports, so right now we can focus upon the food and electronics. 
but the challenge is the slowing down of the global demand. So expanding the share in the global trade, we can let government shares the plan with exporters to promote investment and trade so that India can get a larger share of the world trade. And the meeting, it came at a time when the country is witnessing contraction in the merchandise exports. So we saw that we are having still enjoy a service trade surplus which is basically aiding our trade sector. So that's no doubt that's very important area for us. So we need to understand what is the strength when we're talking about our exports, what are the weak areas where we can still improve, but then there are some other concerns which are out of our control, like the slowing down of the global demand. So how in such a scenario, how in such a challenging scenario, I should say, India can ensure that the trade sector remains robust. So what are the potential areas where we can explore more exports? So MSME sector is very important. You need to know about all the nuances related to it. What are the potential areas which exist where the MSMEs they can expand? How, like when we talk about the women-led development in these days, so how MSMEs can play an enabler role here. So that's important. And then you can like find out about the basic facts about uh, the amount of GDP that is contributed by the MSME sector, the number around 12 crore people, they are employed in MSMEs. So definitely we can say that in a way, the uh, MSME sector is a backbone of the Indian economy, specifically the rural economy. Coming to Indian Express. So uh, let's see what are the topics that we haven't discussed so far. So it's focusing upon the political thing. So that's why we're not taking up these articles in detail. So this is this we have discussed today, the situation in France. What is the cause behind the recent protests and how basically the government has responded to these protests. So we need to be just aware about what is actually happening in different countries. So bubble of excellence. The QS World University rankings may reinforce elitism and caste bias. So whenever such surveys or indexes, they are calculated. So it's important to maintain the fairness element in them. So the system reinforces the same patterns, keeping the knowledge and experience of majority in this country unexplored or that remains invisible. And in addition, it maintains the elitism of a field that is opaque and gatekeeps these spaces on the basis of merit argument, which in turn is decided by the same people itself. So smoothing the pace of science, the National Research Foundation plugs an important policy gap, which have been there are some years, but questions of governance and funding that needs to be addressed when we're talking about exploring or when we're talking about focusing more upon research and development in India.
So parliament is uh, the parliamentary approval for the NRF. NRF, it is welcome. And scientific research is expected to get a, get a big boost because of this. So collaboration on science between the industry and academy is expected to prosper. However, under good governance mechanisms to administer the centralized fund that evolved with adequate discussion with stakeholders, implemented from day one and executed under strong monitoring, the perils of centralization, they will become evident with time. So again, this is also a repeated topic, eradication of sickle cell disease. What is our policy about that? We've discussed it a number of times. So SEO meet, what's on the table? So here, India will be hosting this meet. And so Central Asian countries, they have been considered Russia's backyard. Now China is trying to expand its footprint in this region. And how are they responding to this battle of influence between Moscow and Beijing? So when Russia basically said last September that it was going to annex Dantes, Kherson, Luhansk, and Zaporizhia regions of Ukraine, Kazakhstan had said that it would not support this decision. And this is the position of the other Central Asian countries as well. So it's quite clear that Russia's influence has declined in Central Asian economies. So China is now trying to enhance its presence in the region and fill this vacuum created by reduced sway of Russia. So however, while elites in these countries, they might not have much of a problem with the growing presence of Beijing, but the expanding footprint of China is viewed with great concern and suspicion by the common people. And cognizance of this has to be taken by the respective governments as well. So what is important to note is that these countries, they have started looking at options beyond Russia and China. So here, India also has some opportunity. So India has taken a number of steps in recent months for further strengthening and expanding its partnership with the Central Asian economies. Other countries too, they're also looking at this opportunity. So when we talk about the deep sea mining, the International Seabed Authority is preparing to resume the negotiations to open the seabed for mining. So it is a body that regulates the world's ocean floor and it's preparing to resume the negotiations. What do we mean by deep sea mining? It involves removing the mineral deposits and the metals from the ocean's seabed. And there are three types of such mining. So one is taking the deposit rich polymetallic nodules of the ocean floor. Second is mining massive seafloor sulfide deposits, which were found. Thirdly, stripping the cobalt crust from rocks. So all of these materials like nickel, rare earths, cobalt, and more, they are needed for the batteries and other materials which are used in tapping renewable energy. So they're also used in cell phones and computers as well. And still the technology that would be useful in exploration and mining that is still evolving with time. So how, uh, like how this mining activity, how this is regulated. So countries have their own maritime territory and the exclusive economic zone. So the high seas and the international ocean floors, they are governed by the United Nations convention on the law of seas so it's considered to apply to the states regardless of whether or not they have signed it or ratified it so it is universally applicable so what are the concerns so only small part of the deep sea where it has been explored so far and conservationists they worry that ecosystem will get damaged by mining once this like start happening at commercial scale 
So damage from the mining, it can include the noise pollution, vibration and light pollution, as well as possible leaks and spills of fuels and other chemicals. So these are some of the concerns. So this topic is again a repeat by government is going after the dark patterns as we talked about uh, the online advertisements. So focusing upon their fairness, upon their transparency. So these are the things which you can focus upon when you know how you can like identify the dark patterns. So if you feel there's a false urgency or there's basket sneaking, the confirmed shaming, forced action, nagging, subscription traps, bait and switches, hidden costs are involved, disguised ads are there. So that's how you can identify the dark patterns. So that's all for today. Thank you so much for joining us in today's analysis session. I hope the topic that we took up today, they are clear to you. And do subscribe to the channel if you haven't. And also